All right, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, well, welcome everyone to the SNAP seminar. We're really uh, excited uh, for today's talk and uh, a couple instructions before we begin. Um, the the recording uh, the uh, seminar is being recorded, so um, if you uh, if you don't want to show up on the recording, you can um, definitely either mute yourself or watch the live stream on YouTube. Um, and if you have any clarification questions during the talk, please type them into the chat box. Uh, I will be monitoring the chat box, um, but Sanjay will be uh, pausing in the middle of the talk for, um, for an opportunity to, to ask questions, and then will be a, a further opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, so Siva just posted also the link for the slides. And um, all right, so today we're really excited to have uh, Sanjay Sakatai um, uh, speak to us. And Sanjay is um, a faculty at UT Austin. He received his PhD from uh, UIUC and is uh, currently the Temple Foundation Endowed Professor at UT Austin in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He received the NSF Career Award in 2004 and was elected as an IEEE Fellow in 2014. And his research interests lie at the intersection of algorithms for resource allocation, statistical learning and networks, with applications to wireless communication networks and online platforms. And today he's gonna to tell us about collaborative multi-agent uh, multi bandits. So I'm really excited and uh, 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 over to you, Sanjay. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the organizers for this invitation. And I've enjoyed this series over the last year. So thank you all for, for bringing this community together. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, collaborative multi-agent bandits. Um, this is based on joint work with uh, several collaborators. Um, so Ronshi Chawla is a graduate student at UT Austin. Um, and then Abhishek Shankar Raman was actually Francois student at UT and now at, uh, at uh, Amazon. Daniel Vial is a postdoc at UT, jointly working with me and Srikant at Illinois. Ganesh, uh, he spoke earlier in the series and Srikant as well last year. So these are the collaborators. I'm very happy to have worked with them on this. So let me get going. Um, <laughs> So let's consider a web server that's serving ads. When a user visits a web page, the server needs to insert an ad on that page. So it would basically choose one from a portfolio of ads. And the goal is to place that ad that is most likely to be clicked by the user. We're just talking about a single server problem right now. So in this system then, a stream of users actually visit the page. The web server places ads for each user, it places one ad and sees whether the user clicks on it or not, You know, gets feedback in this case, binary feedback. And the web server eventually learns just from these clicks, which is the ad that is best, quote unquote, by trial and error. Best meaning, which has the, more, which has the highest probability of being clicked on. So the goal here, of course, in this process is to learn this thing as quickly as possible while continuously optimizing to place the best ad. Okay? So this is a generic, what I've described is a generic multi arm bandit problem. Okay? Um, and there's a long, long and rich history of these problems. I'll get into that in a few minutes. Now, of course, there are many more bells and whistles I can add on this, that the user, it needs to be contextual, meaning that it's not, there's no single best arm, the best arm depends on the type of user or the context and so on. All that I'm going to ignore for this talk, I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the plain multi-arm bandit problem, but there are clearly there are all these extensions that are on the horizon. Okay. Um, another example of this kind of a setting is when a single user is exploring restaurants in a city. Each day, these, this person would go to a restaurant and sample, maybe like or not like the dish, and over time, wants to identify the best restaurant. Okay? Again, different words, but mathematically a very similar problem. What we're interested in in these problems is a multi-agent version of this. So let's go back to the uh, multi-server setting. Now consider actually a whole bunch of servers uh, which are connected through a network, and these servers are each handling streams, different streams of users. However, the portfolio ads is exactly the same. So they're all essentially solving the same instance of the bandit problem, but they're all different users. Okay? They are, in a bandit language, the set of arms are the same, but there are many, many agents which are playing the same bandit. Okay? And there's no collision or any such thing uh, in this problem. They can all independently, because two servers, if each gets a separate user, can place the same ad or a different ad. In this model, it's not that these resources of arms are being contended for. All right, so you've got this collection of agents and you would like to jointly learn, to, you'd like to co collaborate among these agents 
to speed up learning. So this is the high level goal. In the restaurant situation, similarly, there are a bunch of agents who are sampling restaurants. Potentially multiple people can go to the same restaurant. That's not an issue. And so restaurants would be arms of a bandit. The users are the agents and you want to collaborate to speed up learning and to get good performance guarantees. In, we'll talk about regret in a minute. Okay, so this is the motivation for the problems I'm going to be talking about. More formally, the setting we consider are that there are N agents okay, and they're connected through some network, uh, the network uh, connectivity matrix to speak, okay, some, some topology, and each agent is playing the same instance of a K arm bandit. So there are K arms, each, if you play arm, this particular arm, you'll get a reward with mean mu sub one. If you play this particular arm, you'll get a reward of mu sub two. In connecting back to our previous example, reward is simply the probability that the user will keep click on the tag. Say it's a Bernoulli reward, and you want to click on that arm, which has the maximum probability in the previous setting. In more generally, they just have means, and you want to play the one which has the highest mean. At each time, the time moves forward in discrete slots. At each time, each agent can play one, one arm and gets a random reward with a particular mean. So if this particular agent plays arm two, it will get a sample with whatever the underlying distribution is with mean mu sub two. Okay. If it's a Bernoulli reward, it will get a zero or a one. If it's a Gaussian reward, it will get a Gaussian with mean mu two. One sample of it. And the agents also potentially can talk to another agent and pull information ask for some recommendation or ask for some information. I'm being extremely vague on information right now. We'll quantify this a little better as we move forward. Okay. So hopefully the setting is clear. And the goal here is we want to understand network structure and collaborations. How does it influence bandit regret? So this is a high level problem. So before I get into the collaborative bandit, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about the standard multi-arm bandit problem. The standard multi-arm bandit problem goes back at least 100 years, back to Thompson uh, in 1930s. Um, the, the, simple, the simplest version of the problem is the following. There are K arms. There are no multiple agents. There is just one agent, essentially. There are K arms. Each arm is a particular option. In the ad example, each arm would be a different ad. Okay. Um, so every time you play, you, at each time slot, you can play one of these arms. And when you play one of these arms, you'll get a random reward which drawn from particular distribution corresponding to the R, the, the parameter mu corresponding to the mean of that R. And so if you say it's Bernoulli, this I'm just talking about here in the Bernoulli case, even though nothing really changes when the distribution is more general sub-Gaussian. That, that means that if you play arm i at time t, you will get a random variable xi of t, whose probability is mu i because you played arm i. That's all it is going on. And let's assume that without loss of generality, these arms are ordered. Mu1 is the largest, mu k is the smallest, and mu1 is strictly greater than one and this greater than equal to three. Okay. You know this as a genie, as an external observer, but the player does not know this. The goal for the player, of course, is to learn this as quickly as well, that the first arm is the best arm. Okay. Um, so meaning that the, the player plays according to some strategy at each time plays one of these arms as a sample, over time gets incrementally learns about each one of these arms and also accumulates rewards. Meaning every time they, it gets a one, it adds, uh, you know, it gets a reward of one. Over time it's accumulating reward by, by its strategy, but mu eyes are unknown. So the player needs to based on past information of place, decide what to play next. And over time maximize expected reward, cumulative reward. So this is, this is sort of a quick summary of what the multi-arm bandit problem is. So, as the intuition is that as we play arms, as the agent plays arms over time, you're going to learn the values of these mu sub i's with varying reliabilities. Those arms you have played a large number of times, you'll have a high, high confidence on the value. Those arms you play literally infrequently, you'll have poorer confidences, but nevertheless. So the key tension in all these bandit, in, these, in this cumulative reward bandit problems is explore versus exploit. So if you have, you've got a bunch of arms for which you've got high confidence, so you'd like to play the best, the highest mean among them. But there are also other arms, maybe which you haven't played very often. And so you're not sure if it's going to actually get a, give you a reward, which on an average higher than anything you have played so far. So this brings you to the explore versus exploit tension, which is classic in bandits. Do you explore new arms with the hope that in the future, that exploration is going to help you improve your reward? Or do you exploit 
whatever information you have because you quote unquote have a higher guarantee of a certain reward rate. Okay. And this, this fundamental explorers of exploitation has been applied in many, many settings over the years, starting from wireless problems to online network resource allocation to online advertising to drug trials and so on. So the, the goal here is to find a policy pie which plays a sequence of arms over time. The arm selection can depend on all the past arm selections as well as your reward observation. So your filtration up to time t is given and based on that, your policy can adapt. And the regret of a policy, R of t, is defined as the the expected gain, uh, expected loss with respect to a genie. What do I mean by that? At time t, a genie knows which is the best arm. In this setting, it knows that arm one is the best. It stochastically dominates any other arm in the Bernoulli case. So it's always going to play arm one. And the expected reward for the genie after t plays is t times mu one. The player, on the other hand, is exploring. At each time, it gets a sample x. Depending if it plays at time s, arm i sub s it gets a reward, this particular reward. And so this is the cumulative reward for that. And this is the expectation or whatever, the policy and the randomness of the answer. So the goal is to make the regret as small as possible, meaning you want to get as close to the gene. And the key results, so the history of bandits go back for, as I said, till since the 1930s, but this regret notion of bandits was, uh, from Lai and Robbins in the 80s. And so regret scales, they showed, uh, as only logarithmically in time, meaning it scales very, very slowly. And you can do no better than that. It scales linearly in the number of arms, logarithmically in time. It also depends on the gap, but I'm not going to highlight it here, but the, uh, it inversely on the gap, the gap between the first best and the second best arm. But nevertheless, the thing I want to take away here is scale log t. And also uh, another major milestone in this road was finding simple algorithms, the UCB algorithm in particular in the 2000s, which actually gets you this regret scale. Okay. I'll talk about this more in detail later. Okay, so that's sort of a quick short summary of what the multi-arm bandit setup is. Now let's get back to our collaborative multi-agent bandits. <clears throat> when we start thinking about this bandit problem, there are several questions you can ask when you want to design an algorithm. First, remember, again, the problem is there are many agents they're all playing the same instance of the bandit. There's a network connecting them and they can communicate over them. At each time they can play, each agent can play an arm and also can choose to communicate if needed. So the question, first question is what to communicate. So we, our setting is focusing on communications of recommendations instead of samples. Meaning an agent is going to say that I think arm three is the right arm to play, but not give a certificate for why this arm three is being played. Certificates essentially mean samples, and samples are expensive to quantize and communicate. Recommendations are, in terms of communication amount, it is much cheaper. And second, recommendations also are some, in some sense more robust. Because even uh, in the restaurant example, especially, the way I may score a restaurant is not clear, but maybe the ordering is the same. So, restaurant, uh, so but we are not going to explore this ordering versus samples in this talk, but this is just a high-level motivation of why we we focus on exchanging recommendations. Second question is how often to communicate? Agents should communicate infrequently, especially with a large number of agents so that you don't overwhelm the network. So you are, so we are going to focus on extremely low communications. Essentially that agents can communicate only once every t to the beta time slot for any fixed beta greater than one. So if beta equal to two, that means that um, you communicate only root t times in t points. And so, okay. So, but beta could be much larger as well. This, our meaning that it's even more slow communication. It could be, uh, our model actually even arose just lo scaling at, as logarithmically in time, though I'm not going to focus on that. Okay. Third is what is the goal in a multi agent setting? So, we are going to focus on low per agent regret, meaning that we want every agent, these are, we are thinking of a flat hierarchy. So, we want every agent to have low regret, meaning, we want it to scale logarithmically in time, but more importantly, we want it to scale sublinearly in K. K, remember, is the number of arms in the system. We want, essentially, we, we are setting up a low per agent regret because we want agents to share the cost of exploration, but jointly exploit the benefit of learning the best time. Okay. Um, so the sharing of the exploration 
essentially means that you have there's also an advantage that it enables parallel exploration among all the agents so that will speed up learning as well because if all the agents are because remember in our setting multiple agents can explore in par play in parallel and so the time scales speed up a lot okay so this is this is sort of the motivation for the kinds of algorithm i'm going to talk about before i get into my the algorithm we are we have been working on um, i want to go through the related work for a few minutes so as i alluded several times there's a very rich background in multi arm bandits going back to thompson in 1930s um, the regret perspective starting from lyon robbins again has a huge literature following from that and one um, one land my landmark in this road was the ucb algorithm which introduces its principle of optimism uh, which which achieves the correct regret, regret scaling in fact you can even achieve the right constant using something called the kl ucb but i'm not going to focus on that in terms of collaboration of bandits over networks there are many threads what's the graph of community collaboration do you have collisions when they when they play when they play the same or there are no collisions and so on so this literature which i'm talking about is without collisions is what i'm focusing on there's again a rich literature when you are allowed to have collisions and so on which i'm not um, i apologize but i just didn't have time to do all the this slide will become very very large if i start putting every other um the uh, fork in the tree so in in terms of uh, kinds of model we have been talking about early work started with our book and kleinberg back in 2005 with and then non stochastic so again now how are the rewards being generated i implicitly talked about stochastic rewards but the arm rewards could be non stochastic meaning it could be arbitrarily chosen if you do that then there's a non stochastic reward model there are i have highlighted some papers along that thread you could have stochastic models with cumulative regret is similar to what we are talking about um again there's a there's a nice literature in that space of booker putnam's work landgren et al chakraborty et al martinez rubio and cola et al and if you look at simple regret meaning i don't want to optimize while learning at the end you just tell me what is the best arm again that has a nice literature and i pointed out to some works in the space the one i'd like to talk about a little more in detail is which again focuses on communication versus regret is this work by wang prutier and collaborators at uh, eth which is very recent work again they focus they have a similar um, interest as ours meaning communication versus regret focus so what they they study is a leader follower approach where there's one leader that selected place all the arms does all the exploration and all the followers just don't do any exploration get the get a, when the leader recommends a particular arm all the followers just match that and they come up with a clever variant of the kl ucb algorithm which minimizes switching between arms and so they show that their algorithm actually uh, achieves optimal total regret meaning the sum across all agents uh, with very minimal communication uh, their communication they show their expected amount of communication um, is constant meaning their algorithm the communication happens because of broadcast the leader switches an arm that at that point it needs to broadcast to everybody else to play a new arm so it's a globally synchronized system in some sense in terms of the arms that play so our objective is complementary to this so we are not we are not looking for the total regret across we want per agent regret as i said that's what the motivation so we don't want one leader to do all the exploration we want the exploration itself to be shared so that's the focus i'm going to be talking about okay so given this background now let's actually get into the uh, into the problem itself there are two things you want to do so i i said that we want to share the exploration but have the benefits of exploitation so what would be ideal ideally we want all the agents to have a common view of what they think is the best arm have that play that most of the time and each one of the agent to pick up one or two arms other arms and say this is mine to make and i'll take care of it nobody else bother with this and in in particular if you think of the number of arms and the number of agents exactly the same which is easy for descriptions not required for the math but let's say k the number of arms is exactly equal to n the number of agents then in this setting that we we basically want every agent to have one arm uh, such that and across agents to cover all these things and in addition have the best arm this is the ideal situation so the in that sense then each agent regret will not scale as k log t it will just scale as 2 log t because it's only exploring two arms at a time in the k so that's why i highlighted the k log t earlier that's really what i want to focus on here okay. this is this is the ideal situation 
but you want to do this with minimal communication and this will basically require that agents need to dynamically update arms each agent needs to start with a small number of arms and change these arms over time and the whole global system should converge to the kinds of things which i was talking about okay and do this fast with low regret so that's the style of algorithm i'm going to talk about it's essentially the interaction of gossip and uh, bandits okay so to run to give the idea of the algorithm let's look at a simple setting with just five agents and five arms okay i just so that we can think about how this happens how this algorithm works so there are five arms so each agent is initially given a an arm that is a sticky arm so agent 1 is responsible for arm 1 agent 2 to arm 2 agent 5 to arm 5 say. this essentially ensures that there's that no arm is missed out by any agent, uh, by the system okay this is the what i call the sticky arms in addition initially each agent is given randomly two arms okay this is just a random set in this case therefore each agent only plays three arms out of five at any point two are randomly chosen and one is a sticky arm so let's focus on agent number 3 just as a thought uh, to see what is going on initially remember in the setting arm number 1 is the true best arm okay that's mu one so agent 3 doesn't have the best arm in its set all it can find if it continues to just stick to the set is eventually figure out what is the best among these three but nothing more so in terms of regret it's going to have linear regret with respect to the true best arm because none of these have the mean matches the mean of the best arm the true best arm but that's how it initially starts so our algorithm essentially has two parts to it learning and communication so we split time into phases which are increasingly of increasing longer duration at the end of each phase they can communicate this is where that t to the beta comes in of uh, the how often you should communicate this matches the communication constraints okay. but within each phase each agent simply explores the set of arms it has okay remember here in this case a particular agent may not have the true best arm at all in its set but the, but nevertheless it will just explore the set of arms it does have so i want to just side track a little bit to uh, talk about how this exploration happens uh, uh, within its set the algorithm that there the each agent is going to use for learning in its set is ucb or the upper confidence bound algorithm i'll just uh, side i'll just talk about this algorithm Uh, this is what i talked about by uh, kasabenchi and others uh, the in uh, the very about 20 years back and the algorithm is the following if you got say i'll explain it in the setting of three arms so suppose there are three arms and these are it's a bernoulli setting so let's say that it, for each one of the arms the agent has played these arms a different number of times for arm 1 it thinks that this empirical mean is this point for arm 2 it sees this as the empirical mean and for arm 3 it sees this as empirical mean however the number of samples it has gotten for each one of these arms is different so because of that the confidences will be different so roughly arm arm 2 it has much higher confidence arm 3 much lower confidence so the confidence error bar is much larger and arm 1 has moderate confidence if you are playing just according to the what you think is the best mean this is what you would play at the next time because it has the highest mean but ucb says that you don't want to play the one with the highest mean you want to take mean plus upper confidence this is what they is called the principle of optimism so this it scores each arm not with the mean but the mean plus confidence and so this one has the highest upper confidence here and so next time this is the arm that will be played so that's what is being written again what exactly how you, this is determined uh, we'll not go into the details but uh, it's if you are interested you can look into the literature on this okay so where are we at this point this point at each phase any of these agents plays um, from its collection of arms it plays ucd okay and at the end of time what happens at the end of time it pulls information meaning it has played this it has play, it has played its three arms over this period of time it randomly connects another connects another agent from gossip so it's our communication is pairwise gossip gossip it randomly contacts another agent and ask the request that agent to tell me if i am the agent asking what do you what is what do you think is the best arm so the other agent from its set of arms again remember that agent may not have the best arm in its set but from the set of arms it has it's going to tell me i think arm number so let's 
do we concrete here? Maybe agent three contacts agent number uh, agent number two and asks for the best arm. Let's say that the number of sample, even though one is the best arm, agent two thinks four is the best arm based on the samples it has seen so far. So all that agent two will recommend to agent three is the number four. That's what is that's what is going to happen here. Okay, it's going to give a rec recommendation. And then what do you do? You as an agent run, eliminate, and insert. So remember, you have three arms. One is sticky and two others, the upper, what we call the upper and the lower arms. Of these two arms, whichever you saw had worse empirical performance, throw it out and blindly trust whatever is given to you and insert that into your recommended arm. Okay. So this is the arm update. Essentially, it's a gossip based on learning. So each is it's an adaptive gossip that's going on. It set, you, have a, you have a set of arms and you gossip that which you think from that set is the highest reliability. The hope is that the best arm will propagate through this thing fast and everything else will get quenched because of this interaction of bandit and gossip. Okay? There's one important thing here. So for people who have played with bandits and know of something called the doubling trick, okay, this looks suspiciously like a doubling trick. You're increasing intervals and getting higher and higher confidence. There's a crucial difference from the doubling trick in the sense that these intervals are used only for communication. Learning is cumulative, meaning whatever samples I got for a set of arms here, I'll continue to build on those samples here. Furthermore, if there's an arm I played here, it got thrown out. Yeah, you, you know, I could, that arm and it comes back, I could use samples. So there, the samples are cumulative here, okay? It's samples are not thrown out. So, Intuition is you recommend the most played arm in the current phase. Choice of pulling an arm uses the entire history. Um, increasing phase duration, increasing confidence and recommendation. Okay. So, and we want gossip to ensure that the best arm spreads through all agents. So here's a sort of uh, flow chart of how this thing might go. So if you have three arms, so arm one, uh, initially it's, um, arm one is the best arm. Over time, it the, the fraction of agents which have the best arm, it, what you want is something to go this way with this algorithm. Maybe arm two initially has a small bump, but it quenches it down again. Uh, and arm three never rises. So you have got gossip going on in this setting, setting where arm number one starts spreading through this network. And I will, you will ideally reach, eventually every user has arm one, it's fixed arm and some other random arm in its set. That's what we want it to happen. So let's see what we can say theoretically for this kind of an algorithm. So we need to have the notion of a conductance of a graph, <laughs> meaning you want to quantify the flow across a partition in this graph. Um, so if you look at this ring graph, the conductance is defined as it follows. If you take any particular set of nodes, look at how many edges go across this. That's called the cut from S to S complement. And look at the volume of this, which is, means what is the sum of all the degrees or how many edge tips are there in here. There are these six edges, okay? So conductance is just cut by volume. It measures how easy it is to flow from one set to another. How, uh, uh, that's roughly what this is quantifying. And the conductance is the, is measures the bottleneck in this graph, meaning you want to minimize over all sets S such of this quantity phi of S. For some intuition, if you have a complete graph here, the conductance will be an order one quantity. If you have a graph like a ring with N nodes, it's going to be an order one over n quantity. So because a ring graph has very little flow from one half of the network to the other, there are only two edges that go across, whereas the bulk of the nodes are on one side or on the other side. So those graphs, information flows very slowly. Graphs that are fully connected, information flows really quickly, conductance is high. Okay, so what's the result we can show in the setting then? Um, suppose we have results for more general graphs as well. But suppose you have a deregular graph uh, with conductance fee, okay? And the communication says scales as t to the one by beta, meaning roughly every t to the beta pi. That means that uh, if we, uh, that means that in every t slots you can communicate a small uh, uh, if beta equal to two root t number of slots roughly. Okay. Um, so it's sublinear in time and it can be extremely sublinear in time, meaning this also can be log T, but I'll not talk about it here. Um, I, in the paper, we can talk about what happens with log machine. 
Okay, in this regime, what can we say about the uh, regret? So I'm looking at again, as I said, per agent regret. So I'm picking any particular, pick an arbitrary agent and look at the regret for that agent. It has a first is the logarithmic in time component. There's some constant associated with the UCB exploration. There's the constant associated with the gaps. But what is really we should take away is this. If there was no collaboration, this agent would have a regret that will scale as a number of arms. Okay. It's rough because it has to explore all the arms. And so this is going to scale linearly in the number of arms. And because these agents are sharing the cost of exploration, let's say k equal to n, just as a thought experiment, then this would be one. So it, it basically has a regret that scales only as three log t, roughly, uh, ignoring the constants. Uh, I want to also highlight that we are, these constants are not optimal because uh, we are using UCB or not KLUCB. But the issues we care about is somewhat different, which is the per agent and the gossip mechanism. So we didn't, bother, we didn't sort of go with the KLUCB algorithm, we just stuck with the UCB algorithm. Okay. The second interesting thing is the impact of the network and the rate of communication. You can show that there's a second additive term that's inverse with respect to the conductance to the power of communication. So meaning, suppose it's a complete graph, this will be a constant. So this additive term is just log n to the beta. Where, so beta, remember in our example, if you do root t communications, then beta is two. So it will just be log n square. On the other hand, if the network is a line or a ring, something where information leaks through very, very slowly, then this is an order one by n quantity. So then this will become n log n. So this cost is very, it's, it's actually super linear in the number of agents. So it, in the other extreme. So this tells you how the additive term also behaves. The third term just depends on the number of agents. It does not depend on a uh, number of arms. It's an, uh, it's, it's an agent independent construct, okay? So the, let's look at some, uh, some plots here. And uh, again, I want to look at the uh, complete graph versus a ring, uh, a cycle graph. And uh, in this case, I think the beta is three in these plots, okay? And you can see that if you have full interaction, meaning the, uh, the baseline for this would be complete sample sharing. You know, it's just a single mega agent, which can play and uh, we can play uh, coordinated across them. Okay? This, the red line is this mega fully coordinated agent no communication constraints at all. Um, this blue is the, no, the other extreme where no a single agent is doing exploration on its own. There is no collaboration at all. And you can now see sort of the effect of different graph structures. This is a cycle graph. This is a complete graph, okay? For, so you can see that uh, collaboration indeed, not only theoretically improves, but even on simulations at least, it seems to give much better results. Um, again, now, how does the rate of communication, how does it help? Um, let's look at one of these plots where we can look at uh, here, uh, let's say no communication, this is full interaction. These are the extremes. One is a polynomial, the other is a logarithmic communication. So I didn't talk about the log communication, but I could even crank down the communication a lot and see what happens. It does impact, it looks like the variances are much higher for the log communications. Uh, but the performance, the amount of communication, it improves marginally. That's about, that's what we observe in our city. Okay, so I think there's a natural place for me to take a break before I talk about um, um, a, a, a more general versions of this problem. So uh, do you want me to go to the chat, Chrissy? How, how do you want me to do this? Uh, or? Uh, so, I, uh, so I believe the... Uh... Uh, the previous questions um, your collaborators did already answer, but uh, Julia, you just asked a question. Do you want to directly um, mute yourself and ask? Oh, sure. Um, I was just wondering why you chose this specific form of communication constraint to the beta instead of, for example, something that depends on the graph size or <laughs> other properties. Um, yeah, we, we just wanted, to, so what we, the way we, way I, we wrote the theorem is that we said that the communication constraint is just some increasing sequence B, B, capital B of T, which says how much B of T is. We didn't specify exactly how the main theorem. And the other parameter being a graph network. 
I chose this so that for this talk, so that it's easy to sort of give a mental picture. But if you have a different B of T sequence, we could potentially put into the theorem and see what you get. It may not give you a good closed sum expression, but there's a sort of a generic analytical result available in the paper. Thanks. Uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask if you have a question. Yeah, so this is Yash. Uh, Sanjay, I have a question. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any lower bounds on the regret? Very good question. Yes, we don't. Uh, we, have a we have a lower bound, but it's trivial. The trivial lower bound is this centralized lower bound. Okay, let's go back to this expression, actually. It's, uh, so I, one more reason why we, we did not go down the KLUCB version. Okay, uh, so one could ask, so if you look at this, if you look at a single arm bandit, you would say you wouldn't use, if you want to get lower arm achieving uh, regret, you'd go to KLUCB. Indeed, when I talked about the related work, that's, that would be the exploration, that would be the explore exploit algorithm if you want to hope to get the constants exactly right. In our case though, it's not even, even if you manage to get this constant right, what do you mean by lower bounded regret? Is it on the average of users? Is it the median user? Is it the best user? Is it a min-max? I'll tell you what I mean. Look at this setting. Let's say k equal to n, the number of, uh, the number of arms equals the number of agents. Okay? In that case, we basically will have at least three terms. But it's not even clear you need to have three terms. Really, you could have a system where every agent just has the best arm and one other arm, which is uh, right, uh, and so that the dynamics is such that nothing is missed out. We are sort of getting around that by forcing we are, that tail probability we are taking care of by giving a sticky arm to everybody. But that's it's not clear that is really required. Okay, so even if you optimize this, it's not clear this is going to get the lower bound. This needs to be handled. But also, if you take two different agents, one agent's gap will be different from the other agent. Say agent one may be de dealing with the bust and the second best arm. So it's going to have one by delta one. Agent two is going to have best and some other arm, even in this case. So when you talk about lower bound, are you talking about min, max, min max or, or max min, or the max regret over all agents? So because we, we weren't even, we started thinking about it, but we, we couldn't make progress. So we just have the trivial lower bound of average across the users. That will have, of course, the scaling correct, but none of the constants will be the same. I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, one, one direction that my mind was going was that suppose there are two arms that are very hard to distinguish and the rest of them are easy and you have a number of agents, right? So maybe in that case, to get near optimal regret, the right thing is to first identify those two competing arms which are hard to uh, distinguish and then have everybody exploring them. So this, I think your approach may not be doing that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe the bound doesn't catch that, that kind of thing, right? It... It's not, okay, very good thought. I, 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 I hadn't thought about that, but the approach could potentially capture that because the third arm, you see, they all may go to the best and second. We don't just have, they don't play two arms. They have an extra arm as well. And where is that? That may actually try to capture what you're doing. Though the proof doesn't capture that. So the algorithm might do that, but maybe the bound does not. Yes, catch exactly, it. exactly. That's a really interesting thought. Um, yeah, but the answer right now is we have only a, this, there's nothing interesting in the lower bound. We have a lower bound, but it's not an interesting one. It'll give you just the right scaling. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sanjay, did, did uh, I guess following up on Yash's question, but what, um, what about with respect to the graph um, structure? Is this dependence on the conductance optimal, you think? I don't know. Honest answer is I don't. This is what we have. This is an upper bound. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sort of hazard a guess on whether this is optimal or not. Maybe somebody else could comment. I don't know. At this point, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there, by no means does it answer all the questions. I think there's an interesting setting and there's a lot more to be done here. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all I can say at this point. So okay. shall I continue then? Or? Oh, I guess Ming, uh, maybe oh. the last question that he just typed the question in. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the improvement of the regret uh, based on the beta that it, uh, is your uh, communication that is t to the power of one, one divided by beta. So what mm -hmm. I think the 
the first term in the regret is dominates, and since, since it's log of t is Correct. larger. Uh, Correct. So, but this term is independent of beta. So, uh, could you give more insight about improvement based on beta? Yeah. So, even if communication is very rare, eventually, um, that uh, they will all get into this setting where everybody will have one best. In, in particular, there's a there's a finite time whose expectation is finite, but depends on the sample. Uh, okay, uh, sample part dependent time that there's a beyond which everybody's arms are essentially frozen. They will all have the best arm and this thing. So asymptotic regret doesn't, is, is not affected by this beta, but the learning time is, and that's why this constant is interesting. It tells you how long will it take to get there roughly. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let me move on to um, the second part, which is, uh, which is about making this algorithm robust. So what, what we mean by robust is the following. Suppose that one or more agents can lie and they can arbitrarily lie uh, with, it's arbitrarily lie at arbitrary times, okay? They could just stay quiet for a long time and then start injecting bad recommendations into the system, what happens? Okay, that's the setting we want to move to next. Um, so, so let's look at this, case where there's just one malicious agent in the system, okay? And this, and suppose this is not even malicious. This is just faulty. Okay? You're just sending random recommendations. Well, uh, if this randomness happens all the time and these, the other agents listen to, let's also assume the graph is fully connected, okay? So there's, we don't even worry about the connectivity meeting. So anybody can talk to anyone and this, this random agent can just, this malicious agent can just inject this bad recommendation to the system. So what, what would happen is that for each agent, it will force each agent to explore all the arms. Over time, you know, if, if you take a particular agent, it has maybe the best arm and few other arms, then it's going, this agent is going to give some other arm. So it's going to, it's going to explore this. It will then, after la much later, it will inject one more arm. So it has to explore this. So it's going to force this arm essentially to explore all K of the, it's going to force the agent to explore all K of the arms. So you'll completely lose the benefits of collaboration. In fact, in this case, you can prove that our previous algorithm um, gives K log T, even with one faulty agent. So this essentially is not good. I mean, it's, it says that that's sort of fragile, that, that previous algorithm, okay? In terms of, in, in this sense, uh, because uh, even a faulty, one faulty node in the network will mess up this entire benefit of collaboration. So the, the question then is, can you make this algorithm? How do you make an algorithm robust to such noise? So this is a very different type of noise from what from the non-stochastic bandit. It's not that the arm rewards are noisy. It's just that there's an agent sitting in your pool who's basically deciding to behave in an abnormal way and gives not their potentially best arm, which is what previous algorithm crucially relied on for the gossip to spread, but can inject anything they want arbitrarily. Okay. So, so there's, let's talk through sort of a blocking idea. Okay. An idea to figure this, an idea to deal with this would be the following. So me, I as an agent, suppose I'm aware that there are people who could lie to me, just don't know who or when. I'll accept the recommendation on good faith and just as before, replace my worst performing arm with this new uh, arm. And then test this recommended arm over the next phase of communication. So I'll put it into my pool and test it. And so I, I, I will only accept recommendation, but I will create my own certificate essentially. And now when I test it, if it's not among my set, it's not the best arm, then I'll call it a bad recommendation. Okay. And then I will block the agent who told me this for some duration. Let's think about this model of sort of blocking. Okay. So I get this recommendation, I've tested it. Um, my testing could be faulty, potentially, or uh, there, there, there is many reasons why it may not have become, the, it could not have, it may not be the best arm for me, right? Uh, it could be a bad recommendation or my testing could be faulty. But in any case, 
I create my own certificate and then block the other person for some duration of time. The tension here is malicious was a mistake. So if an, if an honest agent sent a bad recommendation, simply because it did not have the best time in its pool, and this is expected early on in the gossip phrase, right? Very early on, most people will not have the best time. So any recommendation they are sending is likely to be a bad recommendation because it's only locally best and not a globally best recommendation, okay. at least early on in time. So you don't want to penalize such an agent because if you do penalize that agent, it's going to hurt you because you are slowing down the spread of gossip. You could, in fact, it could, you, could get, you could just lock out everybody and then you're stuck with trying to figure everything out yourself, essentially because you're being too harsh on your community. That's the one side of it. But the other side, it could be that somebody is malicious and we know that if you let these, this kind of behavior pass, you're going to again get a bad, you're going to get a poor regret at the end. Okay. So blocking can falsely lead to a, a large regret, but also leniency can lead, also lead to large regret. How do you balance these two issues? Okay. The idea here is that we, that each honest agent maintains a block list. It's a list of agents who, do not, who they do not currently trust. Okay. It's, just untrust, it's, just, it's a group. And initially the list is empty. You accept a recommendation. If the recommendation does not pan out, put, the, put that uh, recommending agent into block list. So each agent has a different block list. I'm just talking about, I'm talking about from a single agent's perspective here. Um, say, let's me, I have a block list. I'll put it for a certain amount of duration. The duration is the following. If I put it in a phase J, I'll pull it out only at J square. Okay. So it's, and so at the end of its blocking duration, um, you, re you remove the agent from the block list. So essentially bad, bad recommendations are punished with increasing severity over time. The reason it's designed as a, this way is the following. We know that initially there's going to be lots of bad recommendations, but we think that they're going to be because of mistakes. Um, as time, uh, because the gossip hasn't spread. And so uh, whatever I'm going to get is more likely to be a mistake. I mean, there's just some heuristic. Okay. But as time progresses, we are hoping if things worked out well, then the gossip would have spread correctly. And so any anyone who gives me a bad recommendation is likely to be malicious. Again, these are all just sort of soft statements. The way we are formalizing this is through J to J square. Okay, as T progresses, you will be penalized harsher and harsher because for J large, J square is way, way large. Okay. In fact, if you notice, blocking has been sort of thought about in practice. We found that on Stack Exchange, for example, there is a blocking. The moderators for the first bad user will sort of, uh, the suspensions will last from seven days, the second 30 days, the third 365 days. This is a policy on Stack Exchange. Even Wikipedia doesn't say sort of something this concrete, but says that typically blocking uh, from a uh, day to few days longer for persistent violations. So people know about this, this idea of blocking um, for uh, violation. Though there is a difference between this blocking and ours, I should say. This is blocking based on count. Ours is blocking based on time. But uh, in the bandit setting, we had to make it based on time. That, that's a, there's a difference here, but this principle of blocking has been known. And at least we are not aware of any analysis of how generic blocking works. I think that will be an interesting project on the side itself. Can you come up with sort of uh, count-based versus time-based blocking and how, how it will prevent maliciousness is, I think, a cool problem to think about. I mean, we haven't answered that, but what we do have is if you have this kind of time-based blocking, then this is the following result. Um, again, let's look at uh, per agent regret and let's look at a complete graph with M malicious agents and N on honest agents. Okay. Um, then um, let's look at the special case. We have a more generic expression for regret, but I want to just look at the special case. Suppose there's one best arm and all the other arms are um, exactly the same, the delta is the same, just so that the, the description becomes easy. Then the regret per agent scales as K over N, which is what the, which is what the standard Thing said uh, with, with no malicious agent, that's what you would get. But there's an additive term of M. Essentially, each bad agent can add one to the multiplicative constant in this. With, if you do this block list, that's what we've been able to prove. 
Um, is this tight? That's a different, in terms of constants, no. But uh, in terms of scaling, this is what we think will, will, will happen. So there is additional exploration due to M agents. And so this block list will work if there are a few sort of, uh, if there are not too many uh, bad players in the system, then, uh, then this kind of blocking seems to be effective in controlling things. And indeed, you can look at some plots to see how these kinds of things look. Um, <clears throat> so if you have, if you have an Oracle, meaning uh, that gives a very low regret, no communication, don't, don't trust anybody, that's a regret. And with, uh, with, uh, with what we have proposed, this uh, blocking, uh, blocking, you do see that uh, there's significant improvement. You, you can still manage. And I think in this case, there were 10 malicious agents, 25 total number of agents, 100 arms in this setting. Okay. Um, so I think I'm close to, I'm on time. Okay, good. Um, so we have talked about multi-agent bandage with communication network, network bottlenecks. There are many different formulations of this problem. And we talked about a per agent regret formulation in this case. And we saw that uh, network communications affect the additive term in the regret, uh, but, uh, and there's significant improvement for well-connected communication network. And then we saw that plain gossip itself is fragile, but the idea of block list significantly improves robustness. So more details on this are available in these papers. I'll stop at this point. Thank you so much for your patience and interest. Thanks for a great talk, Sanjay. Um, so I'm clapping on behalf of everyone, but um, while we move to a time of questions, and um, I guess, uh, well, I guess I'll start from the chat box. Um, oh, actually, I think all the questions in the chat box are already answered. <laughs> so if you have a question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask. I have a question. Uh, I'm confused about the alpha that appears in the main regret bound. Uh, for classical bandit, there is no such alpha, right? The alpha is... Uh, one optimizes over alpha so that one gets k log t over delta, right? Yeah, but there's a constant, some constant there, right? UCB versus, that's what I talked about when I, uh, when Yash was asking, what are we, are we constant optimal? We just use UCB, we didn't optimize that constant. Okay. And I'm saying that it's not even clear that we optimize that constant, we're still in the running for getting optimality because even that k by n plus one, k by n, it's not, maybe you can just get k by n right there. Then in this case, tuning this alpha is not going to get you to the optimality anyway. I see, I see. Okay. And Ash also pointed out, how should you explore? It's uh, right. for hard arms, there's those issues as well, which is why it's not clear that the, just tuning that alpha is going to get you to that. That's why we didn't bother to tune that right. by going to something else. So I, I was trying to find that slide where that uh, alpha is there. Okay, right. yeah. That's why you just left that alpha as. Yeah, because I was trying to see that if k equal to n, the delta st uh, term can just be bounded by two over delta, right? You just have delta two and delta three in that case. Yeah. Be bounded by two over delta, so essentially you have eight alpha over delta. What do you mean by delta is two over? So, what because there are many many arms. There are so which agent? So look at a particular agent. It may basically have the best arm and the worst arm in its pile, in which case its gap is huge. It, it doesn't even go. Oh. Okay. So, oh, so can you define what delta J is? Delta J is the gap, J, gap between the uh, between the the jth arm and the best arm. Then if K equal to N, you're just summing over from two to three, right? That's the worst. Again, there's an upper bound. You may actually do better. Our bound may not be even tight right there. Okay. That's okay. all I'm saying. Okay. 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 That's why I wanted to focus on the scaling. So I... in, but some user will have to deal with this, which is why I, when we talked about regret, I was asking what kind of regret are you talking about the median user, the worst of the single agents, the best of the, so it's not even clear who you're talking about, which is why correct, 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 lower correct. bound is a little more messy here to talk correct. about. It doesn't mean it's not doable. I think there's a really cool problem here. I just that we haven't done it. So. Okay. Sanjay, I had a uh, Vijay here. I had a quick que uh, question on the malicious agents part. So the, the results that you had was for uh, the complete graph, right? Correct. Because if you had a, a different graph and the malicious agent was say a bottleneck node, you could sort of separate the 
two graphs and essentially the number of agents would reduce that correct common- so but daniel has been thinking about uh, variant weight suppose you have a more general graph but you locally have some constraint that there's no more than that a large majority of your local neighborhood are uh, are non malicious what can you do but even, but even that would not be enough right you, because you need we to know the, it's not quite enough you need some flow con- so we don't have an answer for that yet we have been thinking yeah. about it uh, but uh, that's the sort of daniel has been thinking about these things right so if yeah. uh, the node ban- malicious nodes sit on all the i mean they sort of a separator right so they are a vertex separator then you are then you are that's right you need to make sure there's a connected component of uh, good but even is that enough is not fully clear yeah okay you need no, some thanks. local structure you need a global connection structure maybe that's enough but you don't yeah yeah no thanks as uh, sanjay kind of related to uh, vijay's question um, is like do you have intuition then if uh, uh, whether the centrality of the node um, impacts in terms of if a malicious uh, agent is at a central node in the graph versus at a kind of peripheral node? We don't have anything beyond what I said, right? In terms of formal results. So uh, that's a really cool question. How will graph structure, where is malicious? How do you place malicious nodes to change the time? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think there are lots of nice questions, but this is really recent. This paper, uh, the one I talked about is this one. Uh, it's going to appear in Mobihawk this year. So it's uh, it's like, we have, we have just done this. So there's way more to be done, but uh, yeah. So Sanjay, the centrality question should be relevant even in the first part, right? I mean, you have conductance, but it's also that. <laughs> but there's no malicious there, so no. Uh, we just conductance just came in. Uh, that it's a I mean, big, the regret bound could be lower for cent- more central agents in some sense, right? That's right. That's right. That's yeah. why Amherst is a me- ma- our bound is a uniform bound over the all agents, so it's essentially a max. It's a max over agents bound in effect. Okay. And do you know, I mean, in practice, do you know how different it is based on the centrality or not? Not, not, I, not ha- I haven't seen the plots for it. I, I'm i sure it can be done, but I haven't seen uh, I, I, I don't know the answer right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have a quick question, Sanjay. Uh, so it seems that here you have, it seems like a very complicated problem where you have like multi-agent decentralized agents on network. Uh, have, do you have any comments on, like, and in this problem, you are coming up with like a heuristic policy and analyzing that. Um, have you thought about, or do you have any comments on like, if there is a systematic way to like analyze these problems um, and how far away would that be like, you know, from this heuristic setup? Um, so we do have, uh, I mean, it's not completely heuristic in the sense that there is a bound, uh, which we showed is order optimal, at least in scaling. So you can improve sure. the constant. And that comes back to the same question that have come by Yash and others. How do you think about the lower bound for this? So the systematic way of studying in the standard bandit setting would be to first start with the lower bound and then try to match that because now you know using the usual measure change argument. Here, there's an interaction between the network and the measure. The usual measure change is not clear what are the two scenarios to look at if you want to look at my, if I wanted to go down that route, okay? Um, so. My answer is right now, I don't know a systematic way of looking at lower bounds for networks and bandits. Uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't. It's, that's, that's, a poten- that's, I think, the next, for me personally, that's the next major question in this group. What is the right way to sort of think about lower bounds for, this, for networks plus bandits? What's the measure change arguments for that? But yeah, at present, no, I don't know. Okay. Hi, Sanjay, I'll ask a question. So my question is, uh, what if uh, these agents are playing a game among, amongst each other and each trying to minimize their own regret and actions being the like honest recommendation or not? So will that... Uh, do you have sorry, I lost your question. That? Could you please repeat? I'm so sorry. Can so you just repeat the question? My question I lost is, suppose there are a lot of... So there are agents, right? They're trying to... They're giving the recommendations to each other, right? So what if each agent is trying to minimize their own personal regret and they have the actions when uh, when they have been asked to recommend uh, will they follow the honest policy very good i don't that's a really cool question i don't know that's a cool question i don't know so you want to have these agents not necessarily malicious but somewhere in between yeah, uh, yeah so, incentivized nation. yeah uh, no uh, and i don't know of any results in that setting either so uh, 
yeah, it's something interesting to think about. Okay. Um, okay, I'd like thanks. to follow up on Julia's um, earlier question. Uh, I really like your work. Thanks for the talk. Thanks. And um, uh, could you speculate maybe uh, about different ways of bringing in communication constraints, such as um, as a special arm with its own regrets? Um, I feel like if you want to want to think about the motivation ah. gate in the limit, where maybe agents represent individual users, um, uh, a nice application could arise if, if it was clear um, yeah, how the exploration through gossip would... Um, I see, uh, I see. So let relate. me understand yeah. your question uh, this way. You're basically, so we basically just did a T to the beta. We just put a four, we gave a extra, um, whatever, an external budget. You're saying that let's put that also, like, I guess uh, I'm thinking back to virtual queues and back pressure, where in the, you know, you have a budget for this communication, you want to do that as well. well. I, I hadn't, to be honest, till you told me now, I hadn't even thought about that we are looking at it. Um, so I don't have an answer beyond that sounds cool. Uh, we should think about it. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, a really great talk. Thanks. Thank thanks. you, Sanjay. And um, next one.